In the second half of 19th century, the colonial race was ending. European countries colonized entire continents. In Central and South America, from where the age of colonial empires began, this era even ended, as most of the colonies achieved their independence. The huge Spanish Empire flourished and faded. Then came the time for the hegemony of the British, who captured half the world. The French managed to establish large colonies in North America, lose them completely, and yet again build an impressive empire. And only then, three and a half centuries after the beginning of the world's colonization, the Italians announced their claims to participate. Why so late? For the same reason as Germany, which also entered the colonial race at the very end. In Italy, like in Germany, there was a process of unification of the country, during which the colonial issue was simply irrelevant. By the way, the unification of both countries was completed in the same year, 1871. Of course, the Italian government understood how important the colonies were in the foreign policy of that time. So immediately after the Risorgimento, the Italians started to look for opportunities for colonial expansion. But the problem was that the most profitable territories in Africa or Asia had long been taken. Those lands that had not yet been captured were still within the sphere of influence of the leading colonial powers. For example, Burma had not yet been colonized in 1871, but the British clearly claimed to capture it. On the island of Sumatra, the Aceh Sultanate remained independent, but it was claimed by the Dutch, who later subjugated the entire island. No one would allow the Italians to interfere and establish their colonies there. Therefore, before proceeding with the colonization of any lands, the Italian government had to carry out serious diplomatic preparations and agree with Great Britain, France or Germany, if not on support, then at least on non-intervention. In the negotiations, the leading colonial powers acted from the position of strength. The Italians could probably claim the lands that the empires didn't really need at the moment, but there were practically no such in the world. Nevertheless, despite the complexity of the task, the Italians were able to find weak links in this colonial chain. They managed to use the fierce competition between the British and French in Africa for their benefit. In 1869, an Italian trading company, with the government's support, purchased a port in what is now Eritrea. Just at this time, the Suez Canal was opened, and trading points on the Red Sea promised to become profitable. After 13 years, the government officially bought this territory, which became the basis for the first Italian colony in Africa. The British by that time were in process of conquering Sudan and had not yet reached Eritrea, but France claimed the neighborhood territory, modern Djibouti. The British sought to prevent the French from expanding their colonies in this region, and therefore did not object to the Italian possessions in Eritrea. The Italians, unlike the French, were not their competitors in the scramble for Africa. After achieving the support of the most powerful colonial empire, the Italian army captured the entire coast of Eritrea, since the local sultans could not offer serious resistance. The expansion has begun. The next acquisition was Somalia. The desolate and resource-poor territories of the Horn of Africa were not of particular value to Britain and France, so they didn't settle in this territory yet. The land was divided among the local rulers who fought each other. Some entered into protectorate agreements with Italians, counting on their support in this struggle, while others simply sold their ports to them. Thus, Italy managed to gain a foothold in Somalia, although, by and large, this was not a valuable acquisition. However, each new colony added prestige to Italy in the international arena. The new colonies of Eritrea and Somalia indicated the main goal of the Italian colonial expansion by their geographical location. They encircled Ethiopia, the largest country in Africa from those that still remain independent. During the development of Eritrea, there were border clashes with Ethiopia, after which Italy tried to impose a peace treaty on the Ethiopians on unfavorable terms for them. When the Ethiopian king refused the treaty, the Italian government used it as an excuse to continue hostilities. In Ethiopia, the intentions of the Italians were well understood. 
knowing that the war with Italy was just a matter of time, the king of Ethiopia actively tried to establish friendly relations with countries for which Italian expansion would be unprofitable, primarily France and Russia. The Russian government didn't want to miss the opportunity to somehow influence the division of Africa, from which it has always remained aloof. Besides, Ethiopia was, like Russia, an orthodox Christian country. In the Italo-Ethiopian War that broke out in 1895, Russia supported Ethiopia, supplying weapons and ammunition, as well as sending military advisors and volunteers to Africa. Italy, expecting an easy and quick capture of this land, clearly underestimated the enemy. In addition, the Italians counted on local conflicts among Ethiopian people, which would weaken their resistance. Instead, the separatists that were at enmity with the king united in the face of a new threat and joined the Ethiopian army. As a result, the Ethiopians won several battles against the Italians and defended their independence. In the era of total colonization of Africa, this was an unexpected success for the army of the indigenous population. In Italy, this defeat accordingly was perceived as a shameful failure, for which it was necessary to get even. But by the end of the 19th century, Africa had already run out of territories that Italy could seize without a war with other colonial powers. Eritrea and Somalia looked like a trifle against the colonies of the leading European countries. The Italian government counted on more. So, from the beginning of the 20th century, Italy began preparing to seize new territories in Africa. The target was the possession of the Ottoman Empire in Libya. The calculation was correct this time. The Ottoman Empire was weaker militarily than the other colonial empires, and in addition, other European countries had also recently occupied some Ottoman territories. They were ready to at least stay out of the potential conflict or even help the Italians. In particular, Britain captured Egypt and Cyprus, and France recaptured Tunisia from the Ottoman Empire. With the support of Britain and France, Italy attacked Libya in 1911. Great Britain, which occupied Egypt, declared it neutral to exclude the possibility of supplying Turkish troops by land. Not limited to this, the British also captured the Libyan port of Salum, which, coupled with the Italian naval blockade, isolated the Turkish army in Libya. However, the Turkish troops resisted much longer than the Italians expected. The war lasted for a whole year. Taking advantage of the situation, the Balkan peoples began an anti-Turkish uprising, and the Ottoman Empire, attacked from two sides, gave up on Libya. By the way, the Italo-Turkish War in many ways became a harbinger of the First World War. It intensified the liberation movements in the Balkans from where the First World War would begin. Also, technical innovations were tested in this war. In particular, the first aerial bombardment in history was carried out, using planes and airships. In the First World War, Italy fought on the side of the Entente. As a result of the peace treaties, its possessions in Europe expanded. The colony of Somalia was also enlarged. Britain transferred the neighborhood region of Jubaland to Italy as a thank you for its support in the First World War. After Mussolini came to power in Italy, a new phase of aggressive foreign policy began, during which the Italians returned to the Ethiopian issue. The shame of the defeat was not yet forgotten, and the goal of uniting Eritrea and Somalia into a single colony remained relevant. Ethiopia has dramatically weakened in the 40 years since the First Italo-Ethiopian War. The equipment of its army has not changed much, while the Italian army was developed and modernized. In the new war that began in 1935, Ethiopia could not longer confront Italy on an equal footing. Although remembering the first defeat and wanting to win at all costs, the Italians even used chemical weapons prohibited by the International Convention. After more than 50 years since establishing the first colony in Eritrea, the Italians finally reached their goal of taking over Ethiopia. Eritrea, Somalia and Ethiopia formed one large colony of Italian East Africa. During the Second World War, the Italians occupied some of the Allied colonies, particularly Tunisia and British Somalia, but only for a short time. The British defeated Italian troops in East Africa. 
The North African campaign also ended in victory for the Allies, and as a result, after the Second World War, Italy lost all its overseas possessions. The Italian colonial empire lasted over 60 years. In general, the power of the Italians in Africa can be called pinpoint. The administration and the army were often unable to control the interior regions of the colonies and stayed limited to the coastal areas. For example, in Somalia the power of the Italians within the country was only formal until the 1920s. The guerrilla war in Libya, which began immediately after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, continued until the very end of Italian rule. But in areas that were under Italian control, infrastructure was developed and cities were built out. The capital of Eritrea, Asmara, was even called Little Rome. The Italians rebuilt it in their own way. The views of the town still create a feeling that this is Italy.